Hey everybody, this is Jacob Stoops and we are back for a Halloween special episode 53 of the Page 2 podcast and it's ironic that by the time you are listening because we record on Fridays, release episodes on Mondays, Halloween will be behind us, but that's okay. Uh, we are still going to talk about it today and I am here with my co-host, none other than Mr. Jeff Luella. How's it going, Jeff? It's going well. I'm going to be in a sugar coma come Monday when I eat all my kids' candy. <laughs> oh, me too. It's sad but true. We already did a little trick-or-treating last night in the rain. Not that great of an experience as a parent. Uh, I remember doing it as a kid, and it was awesome. Not that great as a parent. Overrated. Yeah. <laughs> and here with us, we have an extra, extra special uh interview slash interviews and i'm going to do a little bit of uh wwe uh because we have got a great tag team match uh and i'm sure that these guests are going to come over the top rope and give jeff an elbow to the head uh maybe i'll pull out the chair rake the eyes we'll see where things go uh but we've got not one but two yes mr jaris mitchell of Hello, red everyone of Red Hat and an internet robot fame, and Miss or Mrs. Jennifer Colosiero, also of Red Hat. Good, How's it going, guys? Awesome. <laughs> um, if we are going to be wrestling, I just ask <laughs> that nobody focus my knees. I've got bad knees, so like, gotcha. Just Jeff, that's exactly where we're going to focus. Let's keep it above the uh, belt. You're not supposed to let people know what your weaknesses are. Ah, dang. And, and That's... you've got glasses, so I'm going <laughs> to definitely poke the eye, rake the back a little bit. But, no, uh, you don't aim for the yeah. eye because I've got the glasses on, so it's going to protect from any pokes. <laughs> now, if you throw like sawdust at me or, or some sort of pocket sand, like that will get around the glasses. Yeah. So how many of you guys grew up in the in the 80s? I'm not sure exactly how, I know how old Jeff is. I know how old I am. I'm not sure exactly how old you guys are, but if you grew up in the 80s, it's obviously synonymous with WWE, the classic mm. era of wrestling. Not that you guys care about that, but a huge I Hulk existed Hogan briefly fan. in the 80s. Okay. Um, but I have consumed beer and watched uh, 80s wrestling highlights. Oh yeah. Just because... There was a lot of cocaine going on back then, <laughs> and it made for some really interesting content. A lot oh, of steroids, yeah. a lot of yeah. steroids. Uh, and there, it's funny that uh, they're launching, um, I forget what channel it's on, but the new Inside the inside the Ring, as a, as a child of the 80s, who was very like way too into uh, wrestling. And mm. again, in the late 90s, were like the two kind of, in my opinion, classic eras of wrestling. So not that I wanted to go right down the wrestling rabbit hole. When we it sounded like this. you had that locked and loaded, though. Yes, we're gonna, You're like, we're I'm going to steer this towards wrestling. I hope somebody <laughs> asks me what my Halloween we're gonna costume do 60, is. We're going to do 60 minutes on <laughs> wrestling. So uh, I'm Ric Flair. Woo! I, I'll be the macho man. I'll be the macho man. Interestingly, right. Ric Flair is from Charlotte, North Carolina. And there you a go. A friend of mine rescued his, res wrestled his son in high school. Wow. And beat that's him. That's awesome. Wow. That's awesome. And, and that's wrestle, right. Wrestle, wrestle, or like wrestle? Like the Greco Roman. Uh, the real wrestling, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah not, not wrestling. Yeah. So, uh, on that note, we've definitely gone back to the Raleigh SEO well again. I, I feel like out of 50 interviews or so that we've done, at least 25 have been from Raleigh. So there's there's definitely something different in the water there. I feel like you're definitely like creating an intersection of your audience and your audience is either Red Hat employees or people who live in Raleigh yep. at this point. Um, yep. Yeah. So well, Raleigh's just such an up-and-coming tech hub, you know, so. Mm. Some Lots of people, people have told me that it's a third-rate city, which I firmly disagree with. Really? Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I like it seems it like a good place to me. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. Having it's pretty, never been there. It's you're not cool. doing You're not doing anything for your property value right now, Jairus. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been to Raleigh like five times, and each time I saw Jairus. So oh. that was great. 
Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> There were always you can like find better things to do when you're in Raleigh. Oh, I can, yeah. I can well, send you some restaurants. I, There's like got, a lemur uh, <laughs> zoo up the road in Durham. That'd, That'd be, be good. Cool. Yeah. So before we get into SEO, because I know people did not come here to listen to us talk about wrestling <laughs> or Raleigh, uh, but they are going to have to suffer for at least five more minutes while we talk about Halloween and Halloween candy. So. What is everybody's favorite Halloween candy? What's your go-to? And, and what's your approach on giving out candy if you do give out candy? Mm. I um, am thinking about this, like I'd have to say Kit Kats, but specifically frozen ones. So Ooh. yeah, they're like the best frozen candy. Um, I don't have like good fortune of living in a neighborhood where there's a lot of trick or treaters. So um, every year that I have set up to give out candy, I've been like disappointed just sitting there with my bowl by the door and doorbell never rings. So I can't answer that part of your question, but just wallowing in your candy and sadness. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's like uh, at a certain point, you just break out the wine and give up, but <laughs> I um, have never had a frozen Kit Kat, but it sounds kind of delightful. Like, do you do you leave it in there until it gets completely solid, or is yeah, it? Yeah, just... you just keep them in there at all times. It's where oh. you store them. <laughs> well, I have some pumpkin pie Kit Kats, so I'm going to try that here in a little bit. Uh, are those good? Amazing. Yeah, they're delicious. All of Kit Kat's weird shit is what I'm on board for, like unilaterally. Um, yeah. Although I'm more of a like Reese's person, uh, peanut butter and chocolate, that's my jam. Uh, just maximize your trashiness. Um, I am not going to be handing out candy this year because I'm terrified of people with their garbage hands. Um, mm -hmm. And I would prefer not to die from giving out candy. Yeah. I yes. think this year we're, we're making little, we got a bunch of Ziploc bags mm. and I'm not... I go with mini candies, but not because I'm not, I'm not against full bars. I just like variety. So we get a bunch of different of like mini size things and we'll give them like 10 of them, which will equal a full bar, <laughs> but we'll mix it up between like, I, th I think we go to the Reese's half of that and the other half Snicker Milky way that, you know, that rep realm and just throw them. We're going to throw them all in a bag and then just have, either hand the kids the bag or just leave them outside. We haven't decided that part yet. <laughs> you could just, uh, or just throw them, throw the bag yeah. at them. <laughs> just get some sort of uh, light uh, water balloon ca uh, launcher and just oh, post yeah. up I have on a the roof. Slingshot. Yeah. I have a slingshot. I can just pelt like Might get some complaints them. on that though. Eh. No, it's a, but a norm, it, it's interesting. I grew up in a, an area where there was like a thousand trick or treaters and then in my adult adult life, have moved to neighborhoods where there haven't been many. Um, our neighborhood now is, I will say, is decent, except I live on the very end of a street that goes downhill. <laughs> so most kids like see my hill and they just keep going like straight out. But <laughs> what we do is uh, we have like ten kids on our street, so all the we have a few neighbors that have not like that don't have kids that are Halloween age anymore. So we'll leave all our candy like midway on the street <laughs> and have one lady guard it all. <laughs> and from there, like, then we all get to take our kids out for like the hour or so. And then when um, the kids come down, they don't have to come all the way down our street. And they just like, it's, it's a plethora because there's like 10, you know, pumpkins full of candy there that kids get to pick from. So hmm. not sure how it's going to work out this year, but that's normally how it works out. And then we have like a, I have a 20 foot inflatable screen. And now after we trick or treat, we're going to watch witches, I think that new new movie that just came out it was, oh did they did they remake remade it? yeah is that zemeckis yeah it's a, it's a remake mm -hmm. I, I know that i haven't seen the original one either but but that's what the kids record like we gave, left it to the kids and that's what they picked so mm -hmm. so my go-to candy definitely twix love both left twix and right twix it doesn't matter in terms of my personal approach to handing out candy. We do have a, a pretty active neighborhood with kids. Definitely not the take one and move on uh, person, but I will kind of smugly look at the kids that are a little bit too old to be trick or treating. Like who the hell are you trying to fool? You're like, you're like 18. 
That being said, all kids, if they're willing to come to my door, even this year, uh, they're going to get like giant handfuls of candy. I'm not about being stingy, stingy with the candy. Uh, and I would say that of all the major holidays, uh, you know, this, this one, uh, maybe more so than the rest is probably the most well suited for COVID just, you know, it's a natural mask wearing holiday. Uh, not that, you know, not that I don't think people shouldn't stay socially distanced. We're a lot of people going as doctors correct. this year. Yeah. Yes. I, I, when we went out trick or treating last night, I thought I would see more COVID bugs, but we didn't see any just normal, normal run of the mill costumes. Any anyway. ninja, ninjas good this year too, right? Cause you get, yeah, we did see some, stuff. we did see some ninjas. I support so, that. I don't know if I'd want, like if I were a parent, which I'm not, uh, thankfully, I don't know if I'd want to be the parent who's like, small child, I'm going to make you a COVID costume so that you will fill everyone around you with existential dread and terror. Yes. You Seems just have kind of like a curse. Been... Yeah. Well, I'm not coming to your house. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, I would say at a certain point, like as a parent, you you like to exercise a certain amount of control over your kid's costume. But then when your kids get old enough, you just you just kind of give up and just say, I'm, I'm tired of putting this much effort into it. Just be whatever you want uh, within within certain boundaries. But I get what you're saying with the with the covid, uh, although Halloween is about filling people with dread. And that seems like it's perfect. Again, the perfect holiday for COVID. Not that we're, I'm not trying to make light of it. Uh, this probably is coming off horribly. So just know <laughs> we're off to a great start. Let's we're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, we're rolling. All right. Back to wrestling. <laughs> Back to SEO. So that's what the people came here for. Uh, so uh, for those potential new listeners, this podcast uh, not only is about SEO, but it is about the origin stories and the background stories and the day-to-day -day trials of tribulations that you don't hear about. Uh, you see a lot in the in the industry. Uh, and I was as I was driving down the road uh, today, taking my daughter to preschool, I was just thinking thinking a lot about it and thinking about how sometimes you know when I'm on Twitter, uh, I feel like there are just certain people in the industry who just come off so, so smart. And it's almost like you have to be um, a bit of a peacock, a bit of a, a, a bit of a show off uh, when it comes to the SEO world on Twitter in terms of making a name for yourself. And sometimes I feel like those things are great, but they're also a little bit um, hollow if the SEO behind it hasn't kind of gone through the trials or tribulations or maybe, I don't know, I just feel a certain kind of way about that. And maybe it's just my, my own thing. But this podcast is about getting past the straight knowledge jumping. Look at me. I'm the smartest person in the, in the room. And I'm not saying you guys are, you guys are very smart. and way I'm, smart. I'm waiting to see where you're this going is, with this. This is coming off incredibly horribly. <laughs> and, uh, potentially insultingly, but that's definitely not where I'm going. This is about the, what it's actually like to go through and be an SEO day to day. What, are, what is it like? Uh, you know, what is it like, not just from a, from an expertise standpoint, but what is it like existing in this, in this industry and going through all of the challenges that, that you go through? What's it like experiencing the success? Uh, and what, what is it like kind of behind closed doors? What don't most people get to see? So if you're um, coming to this podcast for that, then you're in luck. That's what we've got. So let's start with ladies first. Jennifer, tell us about your background. Um, how did you go? How did you get to Red Hat? How did you get into the SEO world? Do you like being called an SEO? I've heard maybe you are not an SEO, uh, but you, you know, in my working relationship with you, you definitely do SEO things. So I, I thought it would be awesome to have you on here with, with Jaris as well. Yeah, um, no, I mean, I appreciate the invite because technically I am officially not an SEO person at Red Hat, but um, so basically I went to school for design and started out as a designer, um, really wanted to be a developer, um, but they didn't really teach you know, HTML in school that much back in the day, a little bit, not, not a lot. So I, 
basically self-taught development after I graduated and became like a freelance designer developer. Um, eventually like worked at agency and eventually ended up at Red Hat, which has been an awesome experience because being in-house allows you to do things at like a, a more intimate level than than agency, you know, agency, you kind of like dip in, dip, dip out, you know, and projects over and stuff. So, um, but technically I am a product manager um, at Red Hat and, you know, ended up supporting SEO just because like as a product manager, you're responsible for the roadmap basically. And I look at our backend systems and how our backend systems need to evolve to meet business needs. So, um, you know, Jairus and I have to have a really great partnership to make stuff happen, you know, because I'm, I need to be there to help plan and make sure that we have folks queued up to like do the things that he needs to actually deliver outcomes. Um, and there's been a lot of things that we've had to tackle as a team and really put our heads together to like solve. So definitely have gotten a lot of experience in um, working with SEO because, uh, you know, defining requirements sometimes has been a little bit of a group effort. So. And as you were, as you were coming up and discovering that traditional education methods don't necessarily prepare you for what you're trying to do when it comes to development and there, there, when it comes to SEO too, like uh, traditional colleges and universities are like 20 years behind uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the types of curriculum that they are bringing. So as you're coming up and you have those aspirations to be a developer and you're going to traditional school, um, how did you make it up in terms of learning what you needed to learn doing it in an alternative way since you couldn't learn it at college, really? I mean, Google, right, is like the answer to all things, basically, where it's like, I basically made my entire career off of Googling how to do stuff. So as long as you have the ability to be a self-learner, I think that's like one of the most important things, because it's like, you can't be in our industry, in web and SEO and anything, if you don't have the ability to like, keep learning things. So it's like the most important thing. And it's, it's funny because like, even though school systems are behind, some of these kids that are coming out these days like are more prepared and equipped to like learn quickly and adapt than like even, uh, you know, I am and people that have been in the industry for a long time. So I'm always impressed with like the young people and like the interns that we get and stuff like that because they have like grown up with the internet and they're just like so ready to just learn stuff and do it on their own and be really autonomous. So I think that is like, definitely far better than any kind of classical training. Yeah, absolutely. I, I say it about my, my kids all the time. It's going to be what they create when they get older is like, I, we can't even begin to comprehend the types of things that because they're growing up the digital age that they're going to be able to do and think of and create um, for us all, uh, you know, in, in the next 20 years. It's gonna be gonna be quite a, quite amazing. Yeah. And, and, here, I mean, and just, here they thought the internet was gonna be bad for us. But <laughs> well just like I I think about how the concept of a website has evolved since like the, the mid 90s where it was, you know, a page with you know, not not to to throw it out to like weird sites, but you know, you've got like time cube, which is one single page that is just a constantly scrolling mm -hmm. ramble. Um, and now we're, we've got technology, like the, the concept of what a website is or what a web page is or should be is all based on that past understanding. And like, I agree with you, Jennifer, like the kids that are in college now, I sound like an old person they're gonna have some crazy ideas about what the internet could look like rather than surfing the web. Oh yeah. And then you had 5G on top of that, which is like- Oh, that gives 10 you COVID. 10 so. times, yeah, like 10 times faster than my home internet now or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I think you can get like five gigabytes per second or something crazy. Like just everything's gonna be connected now, so. I, like there are high school students who know how to program JavaScript and Python. That's crazy town. Like, that's awesome. That's awesome that I le learned Dreamweaver 
when I was around that age. (laughs) That's That's exactly how I was. It's like Dreamweaver back in the day. Yeah. So. I was, yeah, I was coding websites with uh, tape and bubble gum. So I want to see them make do with that. Get off my lawn, youngins. Yeah. Barefoot, yeah. five miles uphill both ways. That's right. With my and, uh, brother brother on my back. Had to chain my, start the servers. <laughs> my first internet job, I, like, before that, I would just use, like, Notepad or something when I was doing HTML and stuff. But the company I was at was a Unix company. And uh, like Unix, Unix, not Linux, Unix. <laughs> and we sold Sun Microsystem servers. And when I had built their website there, I was like, well, like, how am I going to get to this? Like, just use VI. So I had to learn VI and connect into and, and write on live files for the first couple months. And then I finally convinced them into to getting me some sort of IDE back then. I forget what it was, but um, probably before Dreamweaver. <laughs> but it was... Um, Definitely not front page. I know I used front page for a little while just because it was easy to copy Word docs into front page, though it added so many really bad styles and things to it that it was just terrible. But uh, but I, I I think I've used them all. I still I have like five IDEs on my computer. Like I pull up and I'm like, I'm going to use brackets today or I'm going to use Visual Studio Code. Don't know why. I just use them. <laughs> it's nice to have variety. Yeah. It's like you don't eat just one breakfast cereal, right? Like <laughs> Exactly. And I'm sure some are better for certain things, but I'm not doing, I'm like doing JavaScript and stuff. I'm not, I, I know I have the Python one for one day when I learned Python, but uh, <laughs> that's like one of my days on my list that I'm like, all right, maybe that fat will go away by the time I learn it. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> I think everybody has a dream of learning Python someday. I've been like banging my head against that wall. Um, I can I can do like some spreadsheet manipulation in it, but man, I felt like a dingus. And sometimes I'll ask people for help and just feel <laughs> like the least capable developer in the history of the world. <laughs> Is it so? So that brings up a good question. Is it okay and possible to be an SEO and not know Python or whatever the, you know, whatever the, the term or thing of the day is? Another one that comes to mind is EAT, E-A-T. Um, is it, can you function in this world without knowing everything that there is to know or some of the more advanced or um, shiny objects, so to speak? Um. I'm going to be a little aggressively crass and say that nobody knows fucking everything. Like much, much, much like what Jennifer was talking about, self-learning through Googling, that's how I got to SEO. That's the, the, the way, like anybody who says they understand everything about everything is a absolute liar and probably just trying to take some money from you or something. Um, like continuous learning, con- continuous education is super important, but you know, there, there are different mental models that people use. Like, do I want to learn a new skill or get better at that existing skill? Um, because of my role, I have to be kind of a well-rounded SEO more than, um, deep hyper-focused in, technical or content or something like that. Um, I, I don't think you, there, I think the only thing you need to know to be an SEO is, or like, you just need a passion. That doesn't mean you'll be a good SEO. That just means you can claim that you're one because there's no fucking certification authority that says you are now an SEO. Do you mean that certification that I paid like a thousand bucks for a couple of years ago is no good? You <laughs> are responsible for your own decisions. Uh, I support you. Um, if you want to spend money on that stuff, you can. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm being crass. And I will say there's nothing wrong with, I'm not trying to like paint this, like if yeah. you're learning Python, you're wrong. Or if you're you know really up on EAT or the latest trends, you're 
you're wrong. You're not wrong. Um, but I know I go onto Twitter and I see that stuff just like, just like you guys. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so far behind. I don't have time to look to, when am I going to have time to learn that? Or, you know, my clients, um, their problems yeah. don't involve any of that stuff. Yeah. Their problems are so much more basic. Um, so I focus on the problems that they have and try to help them with that. And doesn't often involve some of the more advanced, uh, the advanced things. So I don't find myself needing to dabble in that often. Yeah. I, I, I don't want that to sound like I'm besmirching anyone for growing or educating themselves or, or um, working towards a goal. Like that's, that's great. But like that kind of gatekeeping, I think is unhealthy in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. I think saying like, oh, if you don't have these four skills, you're not a real SEO is some like middle school bullshit. Um, and we can pull out of that because like, yeah, I mean, if I could write a script that made my job easier, I'd love to do that. But the amount of time it takes to get to that point, is that a reasonable use of my time? Or would it be better for me to talk to somebody else and say, hey, you're a skilled developer. Can you do this thing for me so that I can do this thing over here? Um, I that really nails it, honestly, because you only have so much time and like we can only do so much as singular people. Yeah. And, you know, like when you're an SEO or even a, as a, you know, me as a product manager, like you have to, you're dependent on all, all these people to operate and do things with you according to like a shared vision and plan. So it's more, it's better to be like specialist in what you specialize in and a generalist yeah. in all things so you can know enough to call bullshit. But, you know, you should at least know the elevator pitch, right? For all the things, right? But other than that, it's like, you know, you have to recognize like what your role is and what you want to focus on so that you can learn how to lean on others for all the other things and get yeah. more done that way. Yeah. That, that was legitimately a really hard thing for me to come to terms with because, you know, in, in SEO land, there's a lot of people who pitch the concept of SEO as being a heroic effort. Like, I'm the one person standing between my client and de-indexation. Um, but really that's not true. Like, you know, uh, if you are doing SEO by yourself, you're probably either, I'm not going to say doing it wrong, but you're, you're missing perspectives. You're missing, um, you're, you're missing, you're relying entirely on yourself. So you're not getting any better. You're not communicating with people, so you're not learning or not growing. Um, and you're just gonna keep doing the tedious, the same tedious task because you can't hand it over to someone or work with someone. Like, yeah, that was a hell of a ramble. No, that was good. No, so, no, I, so go ahead, Jeff. I was gonna say, I see a lot of, I, I, I semi-agree, but then I also see a lot of say like SEOs in the affiliate space or SEOs yeah. and, and some and those people where, are badasses. Yeah. They, 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 they can be a little they, shady they be, or gray yeah. and do stuff like, so they can, they learn how to push the limits. So I think a lot of times mm -hmm. uh, with me and, and like being at like a reputable company or, or being at an agency, like you might not be able to push those limits. So yeah. you'll listen to someone and they're like, Oh, well, I built this network and this and this. And it's like, great. That's like, to me, it's a, that's a one point of SEO you can do and it, it borderlines and, you know, could be awesome. It could also get you, depends on how far over the border you go or how Google swings, but um, learning about SEO in general, like I, I think just having that network, whether it's online or at a company and, and actually having battles, like if you're doing it all yourself and you go to work at a company with 15 other SEOs, yeah. <laughs> you're going to like have a, have a bad time because you're going to like be like a renegade or not, uh, not get there. And also having to work with dev teams and content teams yeah. and, materials and just like knowing like, Hey, like I'm not the most important person. And like, yeah, I might be driving a lot of traffic, but you know, there's still a lot of other areas there that um, such as like paid or, you know, newsletters or email and, and things like that. Social um, they all are, equally as important and sometimes when you're you do it yourself and then you join one of those i think you kind of have a frowny face <laughs> because yeah. you're because you're like hey i want to be able to 
I, I did all this stuff before at my old job. I'm like, well, that's not your job now. Mm -hmm. So, well, and that's, I mean, that's interesting. Like those, those affiliate people who are running single person shops. Great. That's, that's fantastic. That's really impressive to me. It also stresses me the hell out. Like the Agreed. idea that like everything into in that's one person and that I am the singular fail point on all of that spectrum, that yeah. would keep me up at night. And, you know, as a person who used to be a freelancer, it used to keep me up all, at night. Um, you know, le having people with other skill sets allows you to, to focus your work and do better. Like that's part of why Jennifer and I work together so much is she has so much of the understanding of our infrastructure, how things are set up, and then historic precedent associated with it, that I don't need to spend six months learning it. So, you know, I can, I can gleam, I can understand, I can ask questions and we can work on it together, but that's, that's the benefit because I have a brilliant coworker who, when I say a really dumb thing, which I frequently do, she can say, hey, that's a dumb thing for this reason, this reason, and this reason. Maybe don't think of it that way. Think of it this way. I don't think I've ever called your ideas dumb, but. <laughs> You've gone, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, but yeah. Um, it, it's kind of funny because I, I think a lot about how like, and Jairus, I don't, you know, don't want to go down a rabbit hole before you've kind of given us you know, like your intro and everything, but like we work at a big company. And one of the things about being in a big company and working with all these people that get to specialize is that you, overall move slower and I feel like it's kind of like the big like elephant that's walking and they walk slow and then like the small mouse is like really fast and zip in and out you know and it's like the smaller you are as a company or as a group or whatever the more hats you have to wear but the faster you can move but it's like as a big company you have to always move small, small like slower it's like the titanic um but you get to do things like mm, differently you know where it's you know like a higher level i guess and you get to get more detailed with everything so but I, I would say that when you're a bigger company it doesn't take as much inertia so to speak to move the needle um smaller tweaks can have bigger bigger impacts if i'm thinking like tactically and strategically sometimes so, like there, sometimes. there there have definitely been times where a thing that I thought was entirely insignificant based on past research and understanding and you just do it and you see a spike and you're like, oh shit, am I that good? I'm not that good. That was just messed up. There, there is that with big organizations, there are also big opportunities to unravel a lot mm -hmm. of string that's tied together. I think I, I had a client, um, two days ago where we were talking about uh, an href lang issue. And the best way that I could describe it was that you've got a big ball of string. And what I'm <laughs> trying to do is unravel that string so that it can just be straight, straight again. Just, just cut it and in half with a sword. That's right. all you need to do or set it on fire. So uh, let's go, let's go back, uh, Jairus. So you had talked a little bit about, uh, starting out or, or doing some, some freelance. So take mm -hmm. us, take us back to the beginning. Um, what is your kind of origin, origin story? My origin story is I moved back from, moved back to North Carolina from New York and I was trying to find a short term job. Um, and a friend of my mother's worked at a tiny little SEO agency in Greensboro, North Carolina called Linkfish Media. Shout out to Julie Joyce, who is the coolest human in the world. Um, and I went in and interviewed and got the job because I was curious and liked the clash. Um, and then I got laid off after an algorithm update because that shop focuses, I don't know if they still do, uh, on link building. They do. Um, and I am a shitty link builder. I am not good at link building. Much better at the other stuff. Um, 
And yeah, so like when I got laid off, I was like, well, let's try some freelance writing. Let's try some other stuff. Uh, and then gradually over time, I realized that freelance writing on the internet in the mid 2010s doesn't pay very well. <laughs> and that SEO paid a lot better, but still not great because I was bad at consulting. Um, and then I got very lucky and got a job at Red Hat. And you've, have you been there ever since? Um, I feel like- I haven't I was, quit yet. You haven't quit no. yet. Uh, and I, I'm not planning on it right now. Until that you, was a in, weird conversational turn in, for me. Until you start doing link building. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> I am going to try and, I, I emailed someone at our HR department and was like, hey, what can or can I, or shouldn't I say when I'm talking to these people? Because I'm always concerned that I'm going to get sued. Um, not really. Well, kind of. Um, so I'm going to try and steer clear of talking about too much like red hatty red hat yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. I thankfully don't have to do link building. That's great. I just looked up, I typed in Linkfish media and right on the homepage is we specialize in link building. And so. Julie Joyce is like the coolest human in the world. Awesome. Uh, and everyone should appreciate how rad she is. I'm also a bad link builder. Um, and luckily I've uh, entered SEO into, in a way where that, like, you know, being the technical side of stuff, yeah. um, that I was not ever an outreach person. And I feel like a lot of people in SEO, that's where they started was in outreach. And no, like out I've- Outreach I've, is soul crushing. I've had a run an outreach team, but when I got hired, my goal was to convert it from, you know, a link building team to like a full service team. And uh, just seeing, the ideas of like guarantee, guaranteeing people like, I'm going to get you 20 links this month from PR, you know, 50 or above and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, I, I know PR is not around anymore, but it's- uh, Well, but so people are still selling it that way. No, agreed. <laughs> and I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of the thing is like, link building is great work. I have a lot of respect for like link builders, it is not the thing that I'm good at. Um, I can convince somebody to write a page and I can tell them what that page should be about much more easily than I can write 500 random emails uh, and then get sad and drink beer. Yeah, I, um, I wouldn't say I've had a, a huge career in the outreach and link building uh, side of side of things. And for me, that is that is okay, because I definitely agree. It was a bit soul crushing. You know, you identify, at least in my experience, the outreach um, tends to be that maybe for every hundred people you reach out to, you get like five responses, maybe one link, and they usually want something back or they want you to pay. Yeah. Um, and it's like, no, that's, I, I can give you nothing and you can just link to me <laughs> uh, or I can move on. Um, and I, I think the people that do it really, really well these days um, figure out uh, other ways to to go about things uh, yeah. a little bit more creatively than I certainly than I certainly was. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, one question I wanted to ask you, coming from the product manager side to the semi SEO SEO side and, and I would say being regularly involved in SEO conversations. If you're somebody out there listening and you're kind of a straight up product manager and you're focusing on product experience, but you're not yet as involved in SEO, how would you recommend beginning to interface with those people to begin bringing them in um, to discussions where they should be? Um. Yeah, so I think like web, like web as a product management um, is kind of like a, a newer thing. Like product management traditionally is centered around software products and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, how like websites have evolved to be so complex that they really are products in and of themselves where they need to be thought of as products, they have integrations, they're complex. You know, we've got all different types of users. We've got the front end, we've got the back end. Um, so if, 
if you are a, a web product manager, which I think um, is kind of a unique field right now, but, you know, it might be that you are just, um, you know, a manager of web team or, you know, basically like a product owner right now of a portion of the website or something like that. Um, I think like people should be aware of identifying technical SEO as a potential gap that's being overlooked because there's really like core things that you need to make a website successful. And this is absolutely one of those pillars. Um, so we've kind of been working through at Red Hat, like how do we identify like what our pillars are and centralize around those things so that we can, to use like a cliche business term, you know, like a center of excellence around those things. Um, so I think it's just something to be aware of because I think a lot of times like SEO gets forgotten, technical SEO definitely gets overlooked. Because if you don't have someone, you know, if you have large dev teams, if you don't have someone actually like working through the business requirements and identifying the gaps and doing the auditing and like looking at the reports and looking at performance and like all that stuff, if you don't have anyone bringing that stuff to the dev team, like the dev team is not going to do that on their own, right? That's not necessarily what they're being paid to do. Like that's not their job, right? So you really have to make those connections. And as new content is created, you know, make sure things are being set up properly and as new systems are being spun up, make sure that there's an awareness that there are requirements for new systems that need to be met. So I think a lot of that stuff often gets overlooked because people still want, like think of things too simply, you know, like everything is really complicated. And if you spin up a new site or application, like that's like a having a baby that you're gonna have to take care of forever, you know, and you need a retirement plan for that thing. Like you can't just, you know, have a bunch of children running around and not think about like, how am I going to pay for them to go to school and blah, 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 everything you have to plan. So I think people think, don't think about the end of life too, for things. So, um, and, and end of life for content and sites and applications is really important, you know, as well for SEO. And I think that's one of the things that Jairus and I have been kind of like, that's an uphill battle for us to fight is like how to make sure the old stuff gets taken care of just as much right. as the new stuff, because it can, it ends up dragging you down. So. And there, there are still people out there who say like, eh, just redirect it to the homepage. Yeah. Just, just pattern redirect the entire site section to the homepage. It's fine. Right. And, yeah. or, Oh, go ahead. Give us, or you've got a, uh, I ran into this recently. You've got a, a site that's like 10,000 pages. Eh, just give us the top 20. We'll redirect those to where we need to and the rest can go to the homepage. And I'm like, but but sir, ma'am, this, this site has generated 100,000 or 200,000 or whatever visitors a month. You really just want yeah. that all to go away? Okay, and that's, whatever. I mean, that's that's part of what we were talking about a little bit earlier is like, you only have so much time in a day. So do you want to focus on, like you could manually go through and, and curate all of those redirects, or you can try and find a simpler system, or you can find a more complicated system. But mm -hmm. the, I mean, a lot of it comes down to just building an approach, building a process, trying to refine that process and hoping that nothing falls through the cracks. So I've got one more question and then I wanna move into uh, something a little bit new that we're calling word association. So along those lines, right, as an SEO, you've got all of the things on your roadmap that are very, very important to you. And sometimes, not often, the, bus the, the, the business's priorities, they have different priorities and they don't always necessarily align to what the SEO priorities are. And, and most times they, they, they don't. And it becomes like you guys had mentioned somewhat of an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. So if you're an SEO and you're kind of struggling to get your stuff into the roadmap and make it a priority, what have you guys, uh, both Jairus and Jennifer, what have you guys found successful in terms of sneaking uh, SEO stuff in or, or like you said, evangelizing it to the point where it becomes a pillar or a center of excellence? Bribes. Uh, well, mostly we've been sneaking it in, but <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I mean, it's true. Like you need some, yeah, it's a combination, right? Like there's stuff that has to happen. Um, you know, people like to focus on the big appealing initiatives, the, the big shiny projects. 
And it's like, I think it's about, you know, dedicating a portion of your velocity to like operational stuff, maintenance mm-hmm. stuff, ongoing goals. So I think like SEO has to be one of those things where it's like, this is a priority month over month, quarter over quarter. And that's just the way it's going to be. Right. But it might be that we go slow, but we just have to stay steady. Right. So, yeah. And I, I, bribes definitely play a role in it, but that's not actually the answer. Like a a big part of it is, ends up being about connecting to business priorities. So, you know, if you're doing keyword research to figure out what content to build, if that doesn't map to the business priorities, it's going to be dead in the water. Nobody's like it's it's going to be harder to pitch, harder to sell through than something that's directly connected. And you can say like, hey, if we do this, we'll get this and those people will do this and then we should theoretically get this. Mm-hmm. Um, like baked into all major projects and yeah. baked into as a layer to everything. Just, just like how you think about it. Just like that's the internal approach that you need to to bring into your skull is just um, if this isn't going to drive business value in some way, shape or form uh, it's probably not going to get prioritized. And there is some kind of skullduggery that you end up having to do when we're talking about like shaving 0.5 milliseconds off of a page load time. Like that's like, if somebody can quantify that, I would really like to see it. I'm sure there are some brilliant people who can and have, um, but, you know, yeah. hey, asynchronously loading this thing, what's the effort? Yeah. Some, how much is it going to help us? Some, people don't like it's those not hurt. Yeah, it's not no, going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and that's, I'm, I'm pushing a big, in, uh, big like, there's a, a big initiative inside of New York Times in general is to make the site faster, right? Because yeah. we... Google came out of the core web vitals and right. we're really mm-hmm. trying to meet those. And, and like, once we like see our vitals, like we do all right in desktop, not so well mobile. Yeah. Um, then Google dangles out that like, Hey, you won't need AMP anymore if you hit all your core web vitals and AMP is just since day one, I was never a fan. Then I kind of like, Same all right, you. it's going to be here forever. And I'm going to like, I got to learn this. And then of course, right then they're like, well, you're not going to need it if you can get faster. <laughs> and, it's, <laughs> and it's the way it should have been done from the beginning, right? Like, well, and I imagine numbers. that New York Times and all of the associated web properties are firing, for, firing 400 analytics tags on every single page. Oh, yeah, and one of them funny. inexplicably redirects 35 times and takes eight <laughs> minutes to load for no good reason. Yep. Um, yeah, it's, I, New York Times is really interesting uh, place and not to talk about any you know inside stuff there, but they, yeah. they love to have their own data sources. So we have our own analytics platform that is made by the New York times. <laughs> so, so they, they really do focus on, on a lot of that, but in general, like we all want to get off of amp. So this is what mm-hmm. we have to do. So we're focusing on that. But again, we, we run into this where it's like, I can put 10,000 tickets into the system and say like, Hey, let's remove this one div or let's change this whole thing. But I'm trying to like boil the ocean first and, and really get in some systems into our CI systems that will like Google has lighthouse CI you go to push something live and it's yeah. going to slow the site down a second, it will reject it. So that's kind yeah. of like, is my goal to get that implemented. Now it's putting in those blockers and like powwow, I'm powwowing with all the, the tech, you know, the, the devs and engineers there. And putting in un- acceptance criteria and well, not accepted cr- criteria. I, I actually need them to implement the whole plan to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and they're all on board. It's just like finding times of your normal dev to like, mm-hmm. all right, let's rethink our process. And that's yeah. where I'm trying to, to do now. It's like, let's fix the process. Then I can go through and like change all our animated GIFs to like WebMs or something smaller. But it's one of those where, because, like, you know, we, I work at a review section and we love our animated GIFs. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're like a younger part of the company. <laughs> so, um, so we got some pages that are like 16 megabytes big. We need to fix that. <laughs> so, and that's <laughs> like, I can fix that on that page, but I'm trying to get that whole site wide. Well, and, and sometimes you, you do need to boil that ocean. You need to come in and say like, this design sucks. And then all the designers yeah. get up and get like very concerned. And you're like, we need to do this thing. And everyone yep. throws a shoe at you. Um, but then after three hours of conversation, you finally get around to like, okay, 
let's try to redesign this. And then mm -hmm. like, that's the moment where you can include those acceptance criteria, those things. So sometimes you just got to throw a brick. Mm -hmm. um, but the rest of the time, it's not good to throw a brick. So this just sound, like, this sounds like wrestling. Are you trying to bring it back to the beginning? Of <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like you can't come in on your first day and break a chair over somebody. Exactly. Like, no, that's, it's like it's like going to prison. You got to go in there. You pick you pick the biggest guy out. You break the chair, and then they're going to listen to you. That's prison one hundred and one. <laughs> I don't want to go to prison or business with you, Jake. <laughs> Uh, so I think a cool a cool project yeah. name would be good, right? Like coming up with something that's fancy. Oh, yeah. Everyone loves everyone loves to have like I'm working on Project Lightning or something like mm. that. You know, laser beam. It's like what Dude, does that there's mean? So, like, there's so much truth to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like um, I don't know. I mean, I've I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Actually, it's like how do you internally brand your project so you can get visibility and get clout, basically? So yeah, you need something I, catchy. I am a person who hates laser personal beam. branding and hates like that sort of brand approach to projects, but it works it and it works. makes me angry sometimes, not always. Yeah, I did yeah. once uh, call a project, Project Hawk Fist Laser Falcon, uh, just so nobody asked questions about it. That had to be a collaboration <laughs> of all of your favorite childhood cartoons. Mm. No, no, I no. It was just like a series of like the first sequence of nonsense words that came out of my brain, in in that order. Um, yeah, and lasers make everything cooler. Totally, I own the domain lasers and bacon. I think I do, or it's bacon and lasers, because I figured they're the two <laughs> things that make everything cool. Don't I'm about to squat it. Yeah, I have one. <laughs> I think the other one might still exist. <laughs> cool. So. Let's move into a little word association. Jeff, do you want to you want to do this? You want to take our inaugural sure. run? Let's, let's figure let's it out. Let's get weird. <laughs> let's get weird. All right. So, how did you envision this? We just say the word, and they well, first. It yeah, comes in I envisioned sounding sounding like we had more of a plan than discussing <laughs> live on yeah. here. But basically, <laughs> word association is will say something, and Jennifer and Jaris just shout out the first. Thing or word that comes go. to mind and hopefully we'll get some funny results and if we don't it's all your fault and we're going to retire it next week mm. all right that's good <laughs> no pressure Jim. all right we'll start with a couple of these so the first word we should have like a da, 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 da. b2b da, da, da. objection that's an acronym darn you're right mm. acronym associations okay <laughs> Ooh, b2b. that would be a fun game what do you think this <laughs> means <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I, I think, so this is, I guess, bias based on what we do, but I, I, at first I, I come up with like technical because like working at Red Hat, we are B2B, but we are B2B in an extreme, like extremely technical audience, right? Like where it's yeah. like, it takes, if, if you're not in IT, come on to Red Hat, it takes you a couple of years just to get up to speed where you actually know enough about what we're selling to speak about it intelligently. So, um, but, you know, and not all B2B is that way, but for us, for sure. Uh, my hot take for the day is I think doing SEO for a B2B is the same as doing to it for a B2C, just with slightly different query spaces. Hmm. I'd agree. You're still muted, Jake. Oh, that's... <laughs> rookie, rookie mistake rookie mistake mm. i will say this is a quick game so just quick shout it go quick mm. quick jeff all right keep moving, consulting <laughs> uh, that's that's my answer just uh. yeah it's good or it's bad either, <laughs> it's either good or it's bad entrepreneurship uh. yeah I, I just feel like it's easier than what people like it, it sounds fancy but it's actually easy it's like you just had an idea and you did it like right. <laughs> yeah conference conferences uh, that's more of an anxiety sound on that one just ugh. um in the past liked them not feeling them now 
Yeah. Yeah. It's it's great when they have free food, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, they can be good or bad. The same. You get to a certain point in your career where you really have to find the valuable ones. It becomes trickier. Web migration. You can't grow for everything. Wow. <laughs> it just became a lion. It's just, it's just wow. different growls. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But they could, I mean, there's a lot in that. So, um, yeah, it's just time, the amount it's of t- time. Either fine or infuriating. It's going to take a while. All right. Since you guys are mostly in house, and it seems like you've been that way for most of your careers, what about agency? We'll just go agency. Oh, this is such a good one. I, it's, like, it's, a, oh. it's a love hate. It's a love hate thing. Yeah. It's like there's well, there's ones that I love and there's ones that I hate. Basically, it's either really good or really bad. Yeah. Jake, you wondering which suspect, one? Suspect, I would say. I, I am currently wondering which one I am. <laughs> I'll never tell. Well, I'll well, tell like, you offline. I when I. When I first got this job and when I first got in here, I was like really against any other agencies because there are a lot of trash SEO agencies and there are a lot of trash agencies that claim to also be SEO agencies that aren't necessarily. But if you have a good agency and a good partner, it provides external validation and someone else to shout about the thing that you've been shouting about. So I like there is a value in working with an agency, uh, especially since time is a precious commodity and you can't do everything. Was that an appropriately political response? That was a great response. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm 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 going to hit you guys with the last the last one to continue the wrestling theme. You might want to hit me subdomain versus subfolder. What are you trying to do? Start like, a fight. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> I I have so little energy. I know for just subdomain subdirectory I fights. <laughs> I don't even need an answer with what you think is what you think is. I just wanted to bring it up. Ah, oh. uh, just to make people Je- mad. Jennifer in SEO land. Like everyone has very strong opinions about whether you should use a subdirectory or a subdomain, and uh, it's pretty tedious. Um, uh, and it depends is always the answer still. It's the stupidest fight recurring. It's like, it's like when you're in like a long-term relationship, you have like recurring arguments with your significant (laughs) other. Mm. And this is one of those things that just is one of those recurring arguments that, you know, no matter, like, it's not going to improve. It's not going to get worse. It's just one of those. Nobody's going to change their mind. Nobody's Nobody's going to say like, right. You're just going to dig in where you just know we're going to fight about it maybe once a year and move on. (laughs) What's funny is this made me think about the end user because it's like, when I think about information architecture, I think about how do you make things make sense to the end user? Mm -hmm. So maybe that could be a, help be a tiebreaker. It's like, you know, if I do it this way, what does this communicate and convey about this content to the end user? Yeah. Such a Google response. I was going to uh, say, and tell us what the end user likes. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, I mean. think it depends because there are, there are lots of layers of complexity tied up in that question. Like, are mm-hmm. you using the same CMS or are you using a different CMS? If you're using the same CMS, you're drunk. If you try to <laughs> proxy it into a sub- subdomain. Um, if you're using a different thing, if you have the technical ability to bring it in as a subdirectory, do that. If you don't do it as a subdomain, it's probably not going to be the thing that makes or breaks your site. Yeah. People focus a lot of time on things that, uh, don't really matter that, that much and, uh, minimize the stuff that does. Mm. Yep. I just keep everything at the root domain and then use a parameter. And, I hate, and that's why I hate you, Jeff. We're, we're <laughs> uh, let's, let's have everything live off of the root and make it really hard for my SEO to tell which pages are which types of pages. Mm. Yeah, it's great. All right. So, so I, oh, go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say white hat, black hat, or red oh. hat. I'm just <laughs> You know what, uh, Jennifer, 
I was I, I have to ask, I, I noticed it about halfway through. You literally have a red hat hanging on your wall. Yeah, it's great. And my question is, did Red Hat send that to you? Did you buy that? Does it have any level of association? Do Red Hat employees all get a red hat? I've always wondered that. Yep. So that's the only reason why we go work at Red Hat is so we can actually get the red hat like solely. So, um, Legally, it's awesome. the only way to own a fedora without being terrible. Right. <laughs> yeah. You can't get the official mind, ones any other way. I've got this oh, beautiful thing right there. <laughs> yep. There it is. His is brown though. Yeah. It doesn't it's count. Brown. Yeah. yeah. I wear it once a year, just like my recurring fights with my wife once a year. <laughs> Right. Is that the recurring <laughs> fight with your wife, whether or not you're wearing the brown fedora? You no, but now, again? no, but now it is. Now it is. <laughs> now it is. All right. So let's move into uh, some questions. So it's actually funny that we're speaking to you guys because last week's winner of the best question submitted to Mr. Joe Hall was your colleague, J.P. Sherman, submitted the, the, the best question. Uh, and uh, in line with this conversation, his question had to do with smashing and breaking things. So uh, I don't think any of these questions mm -hmm. do, but uh, interesting connection. So lots of Red Hat uh, related things going on, especially this season. Um, so we've got three questions and one statement. So I'm just going to read them. They came uh, through Twitter. So we'll go down the line. So Mr. Patrick Stocks asks, the world needs to know how major mod Kat Sinagi is doing. Did I say that right? Uh, yes. Is that, that a cat? Is, that is my cat. Yes. <laughs> um, she's a chunky little treat monster. Uh, and earlier she was squawking outside of my office door. Uh, she's getting thick uh, and still adorable. Awesome. All right. All right. So, I had to do a Twitter search on that and you came up first on it. So <laughs> I had assumed it was some kind of an animal, but that is a fantastic name for an animal. And I'm sure it's a cat worthy of the name. Um, it's very grouchy. I'll put a picture up. <laughs> Grouchy cat. Uh, Heels Four Corners, which is my colleague and uh, uh, Jeff's former colleague, Wade Saunders, uh, asked first a not serious question, or maybe it's serious to you guys. Do you think Wake Forest will be competitive in hoops this year? Because he's a huge <laughs> basketball fan. I had no idea. <laughs> haven't, been <competitive. laughs> haven't been competitive since Tim Duncan was there. Yep. Unfortunately, despite being from North Carolina, I don't do one of the core North Carolinian things, which is to care deeply for either NC State or Duke. Because uh, I grew up in Winston-Salem, which is where Wake Forest is. And when I was younger, Tim Duncan was good. And on that team. Yep. So I stopped caring yep. about college basketball immediately after that. We <laughs> reached your peak. You reached your peak. It's like uh, me. I come from Ohio, so I'm a I'm a Cleveland fan, right? Mm -hmm. So we had we had LeBron James, and then we didn't, and then we did again, and it was awesome. And he won a title, which was the first title in Cleveland in any sport in over 50 years. I had, not only had I never seen a title. My dad had never seen a, seen a title. The last time they had won anything, he was a baby, which is uh, it, quite an amazing thing. But I know now as a Cavs fan for the rest of my life, there's never going to be another LeBron James yeah. and I've peaked. So it's been a little bit hard for me since he left to go to the Lakers to pay any level of attention, even though I do love the NBA game. Um, okay, so Wade submitted question two, so he gave himself a, another ticket here in the lottery. Uh, what's the hardest part of B2B SEO? I would say either time management or prioritization or understanding like the network, like the, the full thing that exists like the big mungy mess of mm. everything. Um, enterprise companies, depending on their internal culture, can get kind of buck wild with sites, pages, things that exist, and then leave it for years for 
an SEO to find and be like, hey, why does this thing exist? Why is it built on this? Who does this? And it may or may not still be a thing that a person cares about. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jarris, I thought about jargon and I want to know if you would agree or not. If like you, jargon is uh, more of an, of an issue to deal with and yeah. B2B marketing in general. Honestly, yes. I mean, most companies have their own language that they use, but because B2B is so detached from an actual customer that that can kind of exacerbate the issue. And like the distance between those things just creates different versions of language that you have companies like Forrester who just make their money inventing words. Um, so, you know, there's always a lot of noise when you're like, hey, we just need to write a thing that explains what an API is. Speaking of jargon, you guys just reminded me of an issue uh, that I that I currently experience uh, where I'm, I'm working on multiple e-commerce sites. And over the course of my history working on e-commerce sites, there's jargon that refers to specific page types. So one client calls a product page, a PDP, one client calls it a PLP, and then one client calls the subcategory page a PDP and their category page a CLP. And as I switch between clients, sometimes multiple times per day, I find myself accidentally using the other client's lang language and then confusing the current client that I'm talking to and going, wait, which side am I talking about again? <laughs> and it's and it's quasi heretical to them, isn't it? They're like, no, 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 yeah. that's the, that's not what this thing does. That that's exactly that yes, it it is semi semi annoying, uh, probably to to them. Uh, and there, there have been more than one time where I've had to like slip up and go, wait, no, PDP or PLP or which one do you guys call it again? Um, and it's not that's not me being hopefully not being a bad SEO. It's just me having a terrible, terrible memory. <laughs> no, it's like, we're just skeletons wrapped in meat making sounds. Like <laughs> we're, we're, we built wow. these structures, like a web page is a web page. It doesn't matter if it's like, you could call it a blog post. You could call it a, a pricing page, you could call it a comparison page, you can build whatever structure you want around it. And sometimes the most complicated thing is just figuring out the language, figuring out what a thing is called. Jeff, I, I want you to recast that and I'm just gonna take that little sound bite, skeletons with bones and meat making sounds. That's probably the best single sentence that may, may have ever been uttered. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. Good, um, good Halloween vibes too. Exactly, yes. exactly. All right, last question. And actually this one was more of a statement than a question. And I think it's to Jaris, I don't know, but it's from Rob Delery. Maybe I'm pronouncing that name right. I've always thought, of, yeah, so it is to Jaris. I've always thought of him more as a force of nature. Are you a force of nature? I, I don't saying? know if I understand. I guess so. I, I don't know. Versus so, being a robot. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. there are people out there that apparently think that you are a force of nature, that mm. apparently you do not know who they are. <laughs> oh, no, I know Rob. He's okay. a, a yeah, Rob. SEO person. Absolute delight of a human. Um, completely day. wonderful person to drink beer with and uh, ramble about. Fantastic salesman, <laughs> too. Like, really wonderful dude. Um, don't tell him that I complimented him that much. He'll get used to it. <laughs> He's going to lie. He listen, listens and he owns his own it. shop, right? I don't know what he's doing right now. I know that he okay. just left uh, his last thing. Gotcha. And I thought he was like trying to find a thing. I don't know. Great hmm. dude, though. So I thought if he, he is still thing. looking for a thing and anybody out there is hiring, he'll increase your leads and revenue. So one, one thing that I wanted to ask before we close the episode out, uh, Jairus, um, you have talked to me privately many times about how you hate personal branding, but I would say that before we actually met, your personal Twitter handle 
is really, really, really awesome. So I think I owe it to, to everybody to ask whether or not you are an actual robot. And then I'll ask Jennifer, does he have an off switch? And if so, like, how, how do I press it? I'm are joking. you trying to kill me? No. Can you pull the plug? Is it, are we uh, able to pull the plug? He's a robot, the right? He runs is on power. with murdering somebody. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. No. If you've ever seen the 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 Office when they talk about making like a three quarters mm -hmm. uh, a three quarters scale uh, statue of Ed Truck, does anybody does anybody get my reference? There has to be somebody out there that gets my reference. Getting just a bunch of blank stares. For whatever <laughs> reason, that is what I what I thought about. Uh, not death, but Ed Truck definitely in the office did die, and they were going to make a three quarters scale robot with a with a short cord so that he couldn't actually uh, rise up and attack anybody. But Legally, anyways, I so am not a robot. So Jarris is in uh, his Twitter handle is an Internet Robot, which is a great Twitter handle for an SEO, which is why I'm having this super awkward and weird conversation now and yeah. asking if there's an off switch. I, I, think I looked you up I, on. I was gonna say I looked them up on Spark Toros and your internet account, your um, Twitter. My account. internet account. Your, your <laughs> Twitter account only has ten percent fake followers. Ooh. And I thought an internet robot would just be followed by nothing but fake followers. So that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm All pretty right. bad at Twitter. Um, I, I think only people who are good at Twitter get a bunch of robots, like so the bots can can pad their their tweets. I'm really just there to like read SEO shit posts and occasionally chip in. So where can we find, where can we find you guys? And Jarris, since we covered a little on you, I'm going to, I'm going to go over to Jennifer first. Where can Talk people Jennifer find Moore. you? All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't know. I, I, I was debating whether I, whether or not I wanted to be found. So uh, <laughs> I guess, um, I guess like LinkedIn makes sense. Um, I have a little side project uh, called Nine Lives Digital, where ninelivesdigital.com. We've been kind of chilling out this year because, you know, the, the pandemic and everything, everyone's just it's a little bit, you know, everybody's a little bit more Bernie outy. So um, we haven't been doing that much, but, you know, we, we do do some freelance work there. We kind of banded together with some folks from the, basically have main gigs, but so, um, but look, you know, I, we just want to be more creative on the side, I guess, and, you know, have an opportunity to actually help people and move the needle a little bit faster. So it's refreshing sometimes to do work for like some smaller clients. So. And then, and then Jaris, of course, where can we find you? Just like on Twitter. I don't do much. Um, if, if the global pandemic ever ends, come down to Raleigh uh, to one of the meetups. I usually hang out yeah. there when they are things that exist. Um, but yeah, you can Google me and maybe find a Christian rock band called Jairus. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we ask all our guests one final question, and that is um, what word of advice would you give an SEO that is just starting out today? And I'll start with you, Jennifer. Um, I don't, uh, I think relationship building within your, your team or company or wherever you are is like mo one of the most important way like ways to like get stuff done. You know, like the, the more people like you or have them know who you are and, you know, agree with what you're doing, like the more likely they are to support what you need to get done. So it goes back to favors for favors, but you know, there's, it's more than just favors for favors. Yeah. Right? But. Well, that's a great answer. Jairus? For the most part, nobody knows what they're doing and we're all just guessing. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty okay most of the time, except moments when it's not. Um, so just try to guess a little less every day, but also try to get good or like i don't know like read some stuff yeah. uh spend more time reading than you do arguing on twitter that's unless you're arguing with someone who's really good at seo and then you can learn from that argument oh that's fair i mean i did <laughs> learn a lot reading twitter arguments when i first got into seo yeah um and like 
Because I, I, I don't know about y'all. Like, I, I feel like I have a mental model of how I think things work. And then as new information comes in, you interrogate your mental model against that fact or that opinion or that thing. Um, and sometimes it's really useful to read two angry search nerds yelling at each other. Yeah. Um, and be like, well, they're both kind of right, but they're also both kind of wrong. So, you know. No, it makes uh, sense. Yeah. I think I learned a lot when people would just call out Matt Cuts back in the day. <laughs> Poor Matt and then, uh, and then Matt Cuts would never respond. I would just see all the responses of both sides. And I'm like, oh, I've learned a lot in this total mess of an argument that I stay 20 feet away from and just like, you know, read exactly. on, but not, I'm not going to answer anything here. <laughs> yeah. If you're brave enough to get on SEO Twitter, just be, be warned. We eat our own young. Speaking of Halloween and we're all just bags of God, meat and bones and, uh, but also funny, but also it can be fun and funny sometimes. And you meet some great people. Um, so with that, I'm going to close out, close real, out. Oh, Jerry, you got quick. something. Yes. I just realized I talk about link or I talked about link building without shouting out the uh, link boys of Boise, Idaho. Um, if you're not following Taylor, Tamita, and uh, Anthony Randall, I think that's his last. I'm not sure what Anthony's last name is. I but his Anthony X Randall. You should read them. They're weirdos and also pretty funny. That is the first uh, Boise, Idaho connection mm. that we've had. Never. Uh, Maybe had that's it. it. Yeah. You're, you're just going to like move geographic regions as uh, new layers and levels unlock. We, we have. We've gone as, as far as the UK and as far the other way as, uh, as Australia. And we've just been trying to unlock levels like you, mm. like you said, uh, unlock different, different levels and get secret prizes. Uh, no, wait, the new stage. Speaking of speaking of prizes, uh, we're we're in rookie mode here. We almost forgot to award the prize for best Twitter question. So who would you guys say before? Oh, look at that! Look at that nice little page two podcast sticker. Also, by the way, I'm wearing my 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 special swag as well, which you can get at our website. But who would you guys say was worthy of the prize? Mm. And that was uh, Patrick Stocks, Wade. And Rob Delery. I think oh, was Rob, was Rob's a question? Does it count? <laughs> I don't think it yeah. does. I think it was we a disqualify statement. all of them. I, I I reached out I reached out to Rob for clarification. <laughs> he uh, did is, that, is, <laughs> is that a statement or a question? <laughs> That's classic. No him. clarification. My, I'm yeah. Not to put him on Just blast. Just screaming into, into the void. <laughs> One of my favorite things about Rob is if you're ever at a conference with him, he'll bring like an iPad and he has a phone, but he'll hold up his iPad to take a picture. Like, <laughs> it's the wildest <laughs> thing. Guys. Brilliant guy. Awesome that, human. But holds I mean, up an iPad to... to there was an episode thing. of Modern Family on that. Yeah. Is there... Yeah, where there was like a, a dance recital and the person in the front row held an iPad up to video the whole thing and like blocked everybody from seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So if everybody is going to be, I, we can't disqualify everybody. So then it's down to Patrick or Wade. Dun, 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 I feel like Patrick dun, dun. is just pandering because he knows, because I've sent him pictures of my cat. Yeah, and He has sent me pictures of his cats. Is pandering um, worthy of an award? I, Jennifer, I'm kind of leaning towards pandering should be punished. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, that's fair. Mm. <laughs> I agree. All, All right. right. Well, that, dun, with dun. that means that Wade is winning the sticker, uh, which I will probably deliver that to him personally since I actually work with him. Just uh, mail so it to him. Right. So congratulations, Wade, on your page two podcast sticker that will be in the mail very, very, very soon. Uh, Jairus, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. Um, great conversation as, uh, as always. 
uh, and to everybody out there uh, who will be listening to this after Halloween. Just remember we're recording uh, during Halloween. Hope you had a safe Halloween, COVID-free Halloween. And, and uh, if you have any kiddos or anything, or you like passing out candy, hope you just had a good, uh, good time and a good relaxing weekend. And now go start your week because it's Monday. <laughs> Thank you for All having right. us. Yeah, no, yeah that's thanks. Great. All right, bye everybody. All right, bye. bye.